minute zero zero. Guess what time that means? Yay! We get to worship together. Aren't y'all excited to be here? Yes. How many of you had to swim? No? No? Yeah? We have three ponds in, in the back of, at Circle W, and it's all one big pond right now, about five feet from our RV. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. The cats hate it. It's taken away their hunting grounds. So, anyways, good morning. It is so good to see you here in the house of God. Um, good morning to those of you on Facebook who have joined us. We are very glad that you are here with us, uh, even though it's in spirit, and that is okay because that's what binds us together is the spirit of God. Can I get a big hearty amen on that? Amen. All right. Well, we do want to welcome you, and we are going to start this morning by the choir is going to lead us. And I really just want you to kind of close your eyes and take in the awesome presence of God. To praise him. It says, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of heaven. Is what it says in Daniel. And that's actually King Nebuchadnezzar. After all the stuff that he went through, being an animal eating grass and the crazy stuff. He finally came back. He came to his senses. He said, you know what? Praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. That was King Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what we're here to do this morning. So take in God's presence. Enjoy being together and worshiping him. It says, sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds and rejoice before him for his name is the Lord. Praise be to the Lord, to God, our savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. I want to read that verse again. Our God is a God who who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Praise God in the great congregation. Praise the Lord in the assembly of Israel. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. I'd like to read that one again too because maybe some of you need some power and strength today. Just maybe. And God's word says right here that he gives strength and power to his people. So if you're one of his people, take that strength and power in because he's here to give it to you. And the last thing, verse 35, it says, praise the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's stand together and let's sing. We've heard the joyful sound that Jesus saves. Aren't you glad that he saved you? Let's sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord to man, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
Psalm 145 says, I exalt you, my God, the King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. I will honor your name forever and ever. All hail to King Jesus. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. King of kings, Lord of lords. He's the bright morning star. As we come to our, our joint time of, of prayer this morning, I would just like for you to focus on drawing near to God. Because sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's hard Monday through Saturday. Because we're busy and we're going and doing all the stuff. But here, let's take time to really draw our hearts near to him this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge that you have gathered us together in this place today and that we are not here by accident. We are here by your design, according to your will and purposes. And so we pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to us during this time of worship so that you are the one we encounter, that we lay aside all of our idols, all of our agendas, and we are overwhelmed by your presence and your purposes in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would shape us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those who are mourning today, those who are feeling hopelessness and despair. We pray for those who have been ill, for those who have undergone medical procedures. We pray for those who have been working hard, trying to make ends meet. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray for our world. The needs are many, but you are a great and mighty God who sits enthroned on high in glory and in majesty. So in your greatness today, Lord, come near to our smallness, and may we be comforted and overwhelmed by your presence. We love you. We turn our eyes to you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. From the Word of God in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that means nothing. Nothing, nada. Jesus loves you, Jesus loves me more than anything. And there's a, a wonderful little song that you might know. Uh, I wasn't sure when I picked it out. But, um, but I thought, you know, this is something that we need to sing. Because we need to be reminded that we are loved. So let's stand together and let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master in joy and in strife, on him you too may call. Jesus is Lord. Redeemer, all glorious King, worthy of reverence I pay. Tribute and praises I joyfully bring to Him, the life, the
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for being Lord of all. Lord, I thank you for the way that you work in our lives. I thank you for the way that you work in our church. And Father, now as, as, we, uh, as we listen to you bring a word through Pastor Scott, Lord, and, and as, as Doobie sings here in just a moment, Lord, I pray you would continue to speak to us. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to hear your voice. I pray, Father, that we would continue not just to be hearers, but to be doers, to be with our thoughts and our actions, like the, the song we just sang each day, for you to be Lord of all and not just part. So, Lord, we lift this prayer up in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. just drifts away and as I look back on the years memories of happiness and bitter tears through it all there was a common thread that cannot be ignored you were there teaching me to be your son
Thank you, Doobie. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're going to be in 1 Samuel in just a moment, 1 Samuel chapter 9. And for several weeks now, we've been talking about that legacy or heritage of faith that's passed down to us from those who came before us. And we looked at, we've been looking at how um, the, those who came before us, how they understood and responded to the word and the presence of God uh, shaped not just their lives, but it sh- has shaped my life as well. All of our lives have been shaped by the faith of those who've gone before us. And we've looked at how it's true for us as well. How we understand and respond to the presence of God is going to shape or uh, provide a legacy of faith for those who will be coming after us in this world. And in the historical books of the Old Testament, such as 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel, we see how this legacy of faith is or is not passed on from one generation to the next. And last week, we saw how Israel faltered at the point of passing on their faith from one generation to the next. And we, we saw how Even though God had provided for them and protected them and had been faithful to them, Israel wanted to be like the unbelieving nations and have all the apparent, I guess, benefits that those nations seem to enjoy, at least in Israel's eyes. Things like being safe and strong and in control of their destinies. And in their desire, they rejected God as their king. The people were not willing to demonstrate the radical countercultural faith the Lord demanded from them. And so while they knew they were supposed to trust God, even in the face of their enemies, they would rather have a king who was leading armies that they could see. That would make them feel safer. Nothing personal, God, but we want a king, you know. And God gave them the freedom to make that choice, but told them they would have to live under the weight of their decisions. And so today, we're going to see how God is going to give them the king they wanted. And even though God's people would have to live with the consequences of their sin, God would still save them. So I'm going to read in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to read uh, for now chapters 9 and 10, so get comfortable. 1 Samuel chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorah, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Shalisha. But they did not find them. And they went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. And Saul said to his servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered him, Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, Come, let us go to the seer. Because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good, Saul said to his servant. Come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water. And they asked them, is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. 
Hurry now, he has just come to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now, you should find him about this time. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and all your father's family? Saul answered, But I'm not a Benjamite, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about thirty in number. Samuel said to the cook, Bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the leg leg that was with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, Here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes, and harps being played before them. They will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power. And you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. 
When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? And so it became a saying, Is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went up to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mitzpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. And you have said, no, set a king over us. So now, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was chosen. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They ran and brought him out. As he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people, which is not necessarily a compliment. Then the people shouted, long live the king. And Samuel explained to the people the regulations of the kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people, each to his own home. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some troublemakers said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. All right. There's a lot that happens in these chapters, but here's what I want you to see from Saul's story in chapters 9 and 10. Even though God's people rejected God as their king, God has compassion and acts in their long-term best interests. And if you're a student of the Old Testament, you might remember from the Torah, specifically from the 17th chapter of Deuteronomy, that God had anticipated this very moment. And so he had, told Is, he had told Moses what a king over Israel was supposed to be like. He was not going to be like the kings of the other nations. He would be an intermediary who would represent the people to the Lord and represent the Lord to the people, almost like a priest. But he would not be uh, the kind of king that the other nations had. And frankly, what God told Moses was not what the people wanted. And so what we see in chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2 is that God provided a king for Israel who appears to be a king like the other nations have. Uh, it tells us that Saul came from an important family. It, they were wealthy. They were influential. Saul himself was an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites. It says that he was a head taller than any of the others. He looked like the kind of guy who was supposed to be the king, right? And so he just fit the part. Down in, 14, in verses 14 through 17, we see that God has compassion on Israel, but still allows them to experience the consequences of their choices. Um, it says that the Lord had revealed to Samuel that he would send him a man from the land of Benjamin. God had heard the cries of his people for help because they felt in danger from the Philistines. And so God was going to help them. And he tells Samuel that Saul is going to govern Israel. That word translated govern is the same word that could be translated to restrain or hold back or hinder or imprison. 
And I think translating it govern here is kind. It seems to be that God is telling Samuel that Saul's time as king was not going to play out as they wanted. They wanted him to govern them. It may end up that Saul would imprison them as their king. In verses 1 through 8 of chapter 10, we see that the Lord fills Saul with his spirit and confirms his presence and his blessing. Samuel revealed that Saul was God's choice to be Israel's first king. And he laid out for Saul a series of signs that would confirm that God had chosen him. And the final sign was going to be that God would uh, change Saul's life. This, this idea that Saul would be filled with the very spirit of God like a prophet. He would experience very special intimacy with God. And his life would be changed as a result. And then down in verses 17 and 19 of chapter 10, we see that God reminds the people of their sin and their guilt. Samuel gathers them together and says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, followed by words of strong condemnation. After all I have done for you, you have rejected me. Basically, Israel had failed to keep the the first of the Ten Commandments, which says, You shall have no other God but me. They chose a worldly king in order to be free from their obligations to God, and then they would be like the other nations. And in verses 20 through 24, we see that although Saul is everything the people had hoped for in a king, there are signs he will let them down. And it's a dramatic moment because they go through this This process that shows that Israel's king was chosen by God and not human manipulation. And when the the lots finally fall to Saul saying that he was king and they're ready to celebrate the new king, Saul's not there. Where is he? He's hiding with the luggage. It's a humorous scene. And they have to actually pray and ask God, God, where's the king? We don't see him anywhere. Please show us where he is. He's in the luggage. You need to go fetch him or he'll be there all day. And there's a lot you could say about this, about the the way Saul acts in chapters 9 and 10 that give us an indication that ultimately he's going to fail in his responsibilities to God and in his responsibilities to other people. And even though that's true, you may have a hard time believing when I tell you that people tend to see what they want. And it's what happens here. So they bring out Saul and Samuel says, just look at him. Isn't he just the the very thing you will all been asking for? And they all say, yeah, long live the king. He's what we want. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. God was better to them than they deserved. Here's what I want to tell you. Because of Jesus Christ, I can count on God to be faithful to me even when I am unfaithful to him. And if you get nothing else from chapters 9 and 10, I want you to see that God was better to Israel than they deserved. He was faithful to them. And I want you to know that because of Jesus Christ, God will not treat me as I deserve. And what I receive from God instead is his mercy, his compassion, and his grace. And in the end, God will rescue me though I do not deserve it. Praise the Lord. I was reading this week about a man, he was a teacher named Bill Zerbe, and he suffered from early onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 49. And for a while, he and his wife journaled back and forth to one another so that he could record what he was thinking and his memories before he lost them. And she would write back to him in this journal, and it would be something they would always have. And one day, after a particularly troubling bout of forgetfulness, Bill wrote this. He writes, Honey, today fear is taking over. The day is coming when all my memories of this life, of this life we share, will be gone. 
You and the boys will be gone from me. I will lose you even as I am surrounded by you and your love. I don't want to leave you. I want to grow old in the warmth of memories. Forgive me for leaving so slowly and painfully. And blinking back the tears, his wife Becky wrote back in the journal, My sweet husband, I will continue to go on loving you and caring for you, not because you know me or remember our life, but because I remember you. I will remember the man who proposed to me and told me he loved me, the look on his face when his children were born, the father he was, the way he loved our extended family. I'll recall his love for writing, hiking, and reading, his tears at sentimental movies, the unexpected witty remarks, and how he held my hand while he prayed. I cherish the pleasure, obligation, commitment, an opportunity to care for you because I remember you. The time was coming when Bill would not be able to keep his marriage vows, but Becky would, no matter what. And I want you to know that because we are all sinners, we will falter and fail. We will break faith with God. We will not rise to the occasion. We will fall short. We will blow it. And on that day, though we are unfaithful to God, he will always be faithful to us. He will never break faith with us. Even when we're at our worst. Paul tells us in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, while we're at our worst, God did the most loving thing he possibly could for all of us sinners. Praise God. In 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul tells us, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And Paul knows the time is coming in which we will all fall short. We will be faithless, but God will not be faithless. He cannot be faithless. We are safe. Even our own sin cannot separate us from God. 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't mean any offense to you, but I promise you, my friend, what you deserve is the very fire of hell from now and all eternity. What do you get instead through Jesus Christ our Lord? Life, forgiveness, grace. Even though you break faith with God, he will never break faith with you. The news couldn't be better. Because you're all a bunch of sinners. You should be dancing. But don't. The question we need to ask today is, am I aware of all the ways God has shown grace to me because of Jesus Christ? I think it's appropriate just to stop and be overwhelmed. That we don't get what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve because of Christ. All right. The second thing I want to tell you today is that the Lord alone is the source of salvation and security for his people. He is to be the sole object of our trust. Let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Yes, I'm going to read chapter 11 now. Chapter 11, verse 1. Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, and so bring disgrace on all Israel. Yeah, I'm thinking that's a no, right? Verse 3, The elders of Jabesh said to him, 
Give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen, and he asked, What is wrong with the people? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent them Uh, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout all Israel, proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they turned out as one man. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of of Israel numbered 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. Then They told the messengers who had come, Say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be delivered. When the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, Tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. The next day, Saul separated his men into three divisions, turning During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us and we will put them to death. But but Saul said, No one shall be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there reaffirm the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and confirmed Saul as king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. All right. Uh, There are several things that happen here that I want you to pay attention to. First of all, the threat against God's people was real. You need to believe this. The Ammonites besieged Jabesh Gilead, and uh, the men in that village attempted to handle the problems. They offered a deal. They wanted to make a treaty with the leader, Nahash, and uh, that deal probably would have called for Nahash taxing them heavily in exchange for him withdrawing his army and promising not to attack them any further. So Nahash says, yeah, we can make this deal, but I need to gouge out all of your right eyes and therefore uh, disgrace all of Israel. Israel thinks, well, let us make you a (laughs) counteroffer. Let us ask for help, and if no help comes, we're going to surrender. And so they agreed. Nahash is a nasty fellow. He was absolutely going to slaughter all the people if they didn't come to some sort of an agreement. And even if they came to an agreement, he was going to bring shame on all of the people of the village by taking every person's right eye. The danger was real. In verses 6 through 8, we see that God empowered Saul with his spirit to make Saul able to meet the threat to Israel. And God also stirred up the people and united them together as a mighty military force. The citizens of Jabesh Gilead wisely sent messengers to Saul in Gibeah, and Saul was out working in the fields. Saul's outrage at the words was magnified magnified by the energizing spirit of God who came upon Saul in power. Nowhere in the Bible does God's spirit come over a person without an act or word resulting that helps God's people. And so what we hear, we need to understand, is that when God's spirit comes over Saul, that means that God is making provisions to save his people. Otherwise, he wouldn't bestow his spirit on someone like Saul but he does and not only so he pours his spirit out on all the people and gathers all these various tribes together to make one army I think if my math is right it's over 300,000 right 
330,000 soldiers. This is, this is the second largest gathering in all of the Old Testament of an Israelite army. Uh, it was all because God poured his spirit out on his people. God ensures success. And so the defeat of the Ammonites and was because God had intervened. And even in verse 13, Saul recognizes that God is the one who had rescued his people by pouring his spirit out upon them. Now listen to me. I do not know what you are facing in your life right now. But if you are trusting in Christ, I have good news for you. I want you to know this. God promises his Holy Spirit to live within us and with us in this life. And the Spirit is all the help we are ever going to need. Does God's Spirit reside within you? If so, you have exactly what you need to face precisely what is in front of you at this moment. Always, without fail, the Lord is with you. And think about what that means. The Bible tells us a lot of things about the Holy Spirit. Here's just a few. The Holy Spirit helps me turn from sin and trust in Christ for salvation. Where would we be without the Spirit? The Holy Spirit accomplishes my transformation over time and gives me power to live a Christ-like life. The Holy Spirit indwells and teaches me. The Holy Spirit intercedes for me. The Holy Spirit produces evidence of God's presence in me. We call that the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit equips and empowers me to accomplish God's purposes. If God's Spirit is with you, you cannot fail. Except to say no. And that is how we fail. But if we open ourselves up to God's presence through His Spirit, then we have everything we need to face exactly what He's put in front of us at this moment. The Lord is with you. To illustrate this further, I want you to see this video and then we'll be done. with you always and the question I need to ask is do I trust in God's spirit for the help I need or do I seek for other saviors do I trust that God's spirit is exactly what I need or do I insist on something else to close the service today I want to invite you to to focus on a couple of different things. First of all, I invite you to believe and confess that God is faithful to you in all things and at all times. Believe this and confess it. God is faithful. 
In Christ, God is faithful to you. You are not cast off. You are not forgotten. You are not abandoned. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful to you. Secondly, I invite you to believe that God is with you always through the Holy Spirit. You are not alone. You are not without help. The Lord is with you. Whatever is right in front of you, you'll be just fine because the Lord is with you. In a moment, I'm going to pray. Marcy will come and lead us in a time of response. And while we're singing, I want you to to focus on the fact that God is faithful to you and he is with you now and always. And while we're singing, I encourage you to respond to God in such a way that communicates to yourself and to him that you realize all that he has done for you in Christ. You'd also be welcome to come to kneel at the altar and pray while we're singing. And I'll be down front if you wanted to come and share something with me. And when the service is over, I'll be out in the foyer for a bit. If you wanted to come and find me there, I would love to to talk with you there. But over the next few minutes, let's respond to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for the reminder today that you are faithful to us. That you will always keep your word. You will always keep your promises. You will not abandon us, even when we break faith with you. So I pray, Lord, that today those worshiping you would be comforted and encouraged by your faithfulness, by your grace to them. And remind us today that through your Holy Spirit, you are with us always. And by your spirit, we have exactly what we need to take one more step on the path you've placed before us. Help us to trust you, increase our faith, and may your spirit have sway in our lives this day. And now, Lord, may your will be done as we respond to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we depart from here today, we pray that you pour out your love on us. We are from different backgrounds and different walks of life, but we are here with one heart and one aim. Be with us all as we go, and let us uh, let your blessings be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all have a good week. We're going to end our service today with the bond of love. So just pretend like you're reaching out and holding each other's hands. <laughs> we are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Amen. God bless you.
you. We'll see you again next week.